Welcome to the Dog Party, your home for the best Georgia Bulldogs football talk. It's local insight you can't get anywhere else, but right here at Locked On. I'm your host, Tanitra Batiste. Alongside me are Jarvis Davis and Brent Rollins. Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on or enter promo code locked on for a free water bottle with any purchase. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you. So now it is time to get the party started. Guys, Georgia had a very, we'll call it interesting, an interesting turn against South Carolina this yeah, past weekend, fair. but they do come away with the W and they do still remain number one in the country. But when you take a look at that game and actually put it against what they've done the first three weeks of this season, what did you learn about Georgia's offense, especially in the win against South Carolina? I think one of the things that you have to kind of take a look at is like wh what I've gotten used to ju seeing Georgia do, and that's dominate up front, right? And when you talk about Xavier Truss and how he started off that game at the left guard spot, it was a little shaky. And I, I think uh, T.J. Sanders, uh, he can send that, that tape to, to the NFL because he, he, made some, he made himself some money uh, in that particular game. So I think just the offensive line, the struggles, and then the, obviously – the injury to Marius Mims, who's projected to be a first-round pick, those are two big things that you got to take a look at and say, you know what, I can understand why Georgia has gotten off to a, a, a little slow start, specifically in the first half of games, because the offensive line is not what we're used to seeing. Well, piggybacking off that, I think the biggest thing you learned this week was that you know, with the NFL, we hear the phrase running backs don't matter so much like it because of the uh, interchangeability of running backs. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? It ma guess what matters for it matters for Georgia. Yes, getting Dejanet, getting Dejan Edwards back was a big boost to the offense, and it just mm -hmm. the biggest thing you see is when you don't run outside zone scheme like a lot of Atlanta fans who've seen the Falcons run. When you don't run that, and your quarterback is not a part of the run game like what we see at the University of Georgia, it yes. puts so much emphasis on the running backs to actually be really good. Absolutely. And you yes. saw the patience with Edwards, ability to make people miss, very tight cuts, it, him being back, and then the little bit of burst you got from Milton while he was healthy in there, and then yeah. Cash Jones making a few runs. Like You just see that running backs do matter when your quarterback is not necessarily a part of your running game. Indeed, and oftentimes, especially like you said with RBU, you need those running backs sometimes to just Grind away, grind away, grind away until that offense can get a rhythm and get you back in if passing is the way you, you need to go to get back in the game. But, yeah, that offense is, as you mentioned, Brent, similar to the Falcons. It doesn't run without the run. Yep, very much so. And and to be honest with you, T, to add, kind of add to that, like Dejan Edwards is the guy that is one of my favorite backs out of Georgia because – He's a guy that, you know, I've been kind of, I've been covering the guy since, since high school. You know, I actually did one of his games um, a, a few years ago. So I think when you look at what he brings to the table, like to, to be able to break somebody off in the open field and, and kind of put that stump, that foot in the ground and just get up, get up field. Those are some of the things that, that Georgia needs right now from a, a explosive playmaking ability. Like they don't really necessarily have there some guys that are out, you know, off as far as the wide receiver position that that you know, they are able to, you know, get into that a flow of an offense. So for Dejan Edwards to be back, like Brent said, I think he's absolutely huge. Like I said, he's, he's my favorite running back in his Georgia backfield right now. And the fact that he's healthy, I think that's going to help get this offense off to the start they need to get to. Now, Brent. If you're looking at the dogs on Sundays, they are absolutely having a ball in the NFL, probably starting up top with Jalen Carter. But the Very dogs that are in place for this defense 2023 on a Saturday, maybe we have not seen kind of that signature dog defense from old. But when it counted, when they needed to slow Spencer Rattler and company down, they did their job. So what did you learn about the defense of the dogs against South Carolina the last weekend? Two big things for me. One that stood out, you talked about the pressure and how much they pressured Rattler. It was right around 50% of his dropbacks that he, they got pressure on him, and they dialed it up very much so in the second half. But yeah. when you look at over the past three seasons, so two title years and then this season, there's only been three sort of down players, front four type players, that have gotten to have multiple games with five-plus quarterback pressures. Trayvon Walker, Jalen Carter, and the new one, number 97, Mr. Warren Brinson. So, mm -hmm. like, 
that element emerging when you add that with Michael Williams, that's one that's yeah. one big thing for me. The other part is how important Javon Bullard is. He didn't play. Yeah. You saw sort of the safety rotation early. Like I think South Carolina was limited once Juice Wells went, went out of the game. They were limited offensively, and that was going to eventually take over. But you just see how important Bullard is because when you have Bullard, Starks, and then now Tyke Smith, those three guys playing at a very, very high level, it allows, I think, the development and the domination to occur on the front four, front six that you see a little bit more so used to normal kind of deal. Yeah, I'm glad that you added, you said Michael Williams because like he's another another young guy that's my favorite. Like when you're talking about somebody that you can just say, hey, line up here outside edge of this tackle right here, and then as soon as it's third and long, I want you to just take off and go get the quarterback. He's that type of guy. He has that type of talent. And and Warren Brinson, like he's he's a disruptor as well. So I, when you think about Georgia defense, like Javon Bullard is absolutely important because like we saw missed tackles, we saw guys running wide open. Like for a Kirby Smart coach defense, I know Will Mitchell up is the co-defense coordinator and all that good stuff. I get it. But we all know Kirby Smart has his hands all over this defense. And for those guys to be out there missing tackles, I would paid to be a fly on the wall in that in that halftime, in that locker room at halftime, because I'm sure he laid into those guys because you just aren't used to seeing that type of stuff. Uh, defensively, like guys just running wide open and, and guys missing tackles, like on that screen, that tunnel screen. I'm just like, what is going on? Because most of the time, when you got those defensive linemen coming off the ball, like you do, once they realize that it's screen, I know the for a fact Kirby is teaching those guys to turn your butt around and run because you're not that good. <laughs> you know, go make the tackle and, and, and force that wide receiver to kind of push that ball back outside and, and kind of tunnel them, funnel them in so they make the tackle, but they weren't able to do that. So, I think that was a thing that really just stood out to me, just just the, from the fundamental standpoint. Because, like I said, even though guys have been young in the past, so many guys have gone on to the NFL in the past. But like the guys that do come in and play that are young, they are technically sound because Kirby Smart demand that. I'm sure. You know, the interesting point you brought up is the halftime part of it. Because I would almost bet that it was the opposite. I bet he was very even keeled at halftime knowing that, hey, I've got a, a team that's kind of new and somewhat young, and, my, and the leader specifically, you know, the quarterback at least is young. Thus, I'm going to stay calm and not necessarily push any kind of panic buttons being down 14 to 3. Like, right. I bet he was actually very calm. Now, maybe the defensive side a little bit because defense is, uh, you know, it depends so much on energy. But I, I would almost bet that he was actually very calm at halftime because I, I saw that on Twitter kind of, hey, I'd, hate, I'd love to see the halftime speech. Like I said, I bet it was very – one play at a time, like he said in the interview, one moment at a time when like I would bet he was actually very calm in half of this game. Yeah, I actually had a chance to listen this morning to his Monday morning presser. And yeah, I'd have to agree with you, Brent. He was decidedly calm. And it wasn't one of those calms where, hey, it's 48 hours later and I found a way to calm myself down. It was almost like to your, your point about that being a younger team or that team kind of still finding its way. It was almost like he was saying, hey, I'm going to put out all the good juju all the good vibes to let them know hey i'm behind you regardless of you know what it's looked like the first three weeks particularly the third week against south carolina so yeah maybe in these moments until he knows those guys are where they need to be to be able to manage his fire seems like he's kind of taking a different route based on what i heard in that press conference yesterday that he was also alluding to how he handled things on Saturday. But speaking of that, yeah, young core, you've only, we're only three weeks in, so you guys may change this next week or the following week. But right now, when you look at this dogs team, kind of what would you say? And I say one word, but I mean, if you need to use a couple, that's quite fine. But for you, what would you say is that one word that would say, Hey, this is the identity of this 2023 team so far. I will have to use a phrase. I'll say they're still trying to figure it out. Um, and, and thankfully, they had two preseason games uh, to start the season. And then they went into SEC play, you know, and that was kind of like a warm up to the SEC. You know, and, and if you're looking at the schedule throughout the rest of the season, like, OK, when do they actually start, you know, playing the big dogs? And, and, and as far as and the overarching theme in the SEC, it's kind of like things aren't the same. So I think that, you know, thankfully, you know, that's the case. So, you know, Kirby Smart right now, they're just trying to figure it out. Actually, I, I went very similar out with my one word. My one word was unknown. Yeah. Like, mm. Everything mm. is really unknown because even if you, you know, you got this week, UAB, you've got 
the following week. Now, the following week at Auburn gets a little bit interesting because now you're in a road, you're in a hostile environment, but they're mm-hmm. still very much talent. You know, not there. Deficient. Learning themselves. Deficient is a good word. <laughs> yeah. uh, you free the same this week. But yes. they're still learning. And then you got your back home again and then road at Vandy. So mm-hmm. to me, you're sort of building to where you get to that off week to where yeah. okay, by the time you're on that off week with Florida and the stretch down, you know, Florida, Ole Miss, Tennessee, that stretch. Yeah. That's where you sort of should know, hey, who I am at this. So to me at this point, your one word's kind of unknown. Yeah, and I'm going to go grade-wise, and I'll say incomplete. That's kind of what I see it as at this point. <laughs> but I, I know it'll get better, and I know it'll get clearer. But as of today, I'll say incomplete. Now, you guys mentioned something that we'll talk about in the next segment when we go between the hedges. Injuries have played a big part in what we've seen the dogs put on the field. But before we go between the hedges first, Jarvis, tell us a little bit more about bird dogs. Appreciate that, T. Jarvis Davis here for Bird Dogs. Guess what, guys? Bird Dogs make you look really good. And you know how I know that for a fact? Because when I was out there at training camp sweating my behind off, Bird Dogs saved my life. They passed the big man test. Yes, you don't know what the big man test is? That means they got that, that nice material to make you feel cool and everything. And, and, you, and it makes you feel comfortable. And they fit way better than those khaki shorts. I promise you, I'm never wearing khaki shorts ever again out to a practice to cover the Falcons. Bird dogs are my go-to. And they're functional for any occasion where you want to go on golfing or you want to go on a date or even out with your, with your spouse or pool to work out, whatever they want. These things can be worn anywhere so here's what i want you to do i want you to go to birddogs.com slash locked on or in the promo code locked on at checkout for a free bird dogs water bottle with your order yes you're going to get a free water bottle just for putting in that code locked on so birddogs.com slash locked on for a free water bottle and i promise you guys guess what you don't want to take your birds off i promise you So Kirby Smart had his weekly press conference this past Monday, and he talked about the fact that, and this was mind-blowing to think, he's been there since 2016, and yet this season has had his longest injury list. And there's so many on the injured list right now that we can't even call all the names. I'll just throw out a couple of them to you guys, like Lab McConkie dealing with his back issue. You guys talked about Javon Buller dealing with the ankle, Brock Bowers. Amarius Mims being the, the more recent, he'll be undergoing surgery on that ankle. Kendall Milton, Branson Robinson's out for the season. I mean, you can just go so many places where they really are going to their second, if not in some cases, maybe even their third stringer. But when you look at that, how much of an impact will these injuries potentially have, especially, and just as you talked about, Brent, especially as you start to dig deeper into conference play? It's not so much, and the injuries are big. I mean, you think about overall three, I think three of probably their six best players you haven't really seen much of, and then now you're definitely not going to see with Mims for a while. Mm-hmm. It's now to the point where you get you get to a certain point and you can't have any more. Like mm-hmm. there's a, There becomes a tipping point with injuries, and you can only lose so much. And I think they're going to be okay in this stretch, And but it's – Again, it's going to put more on the quarterback. But I think the biggest thing, looking at, okay, how can you survive? One, your schedule is obviously you should be. You're more talented. But also the depth of the receiver room. Getting Dominic Lovick and giving Rara Thomas in his transfers with McConkey specifically and then Bowers. Because, like, your running backs, it was never really going to be the biggest play thing, and the, the part of your offense. Your best players were going to be your receivers. Mm-hmm. Those two guys being there and the depth of the receiver room, Dylan Bell's emergence a little bit, both as receiver yeah. as well as running back playmaker. I think it's going to help, but you've getting close to very much so that tipping point. Yeah. Yeah. And to kind of add to on top of what you're saying, Brent, I think one of the things that I was very pleased to see uh, was in the, in the first, um, first series uh, coming out of that set, um, seconds, coming out in this, coming out of the half mm-hmm. after the second half is the fact that, you know, they actually got the ball to the guys you just mentioned, Ra Ra Thomas. They got it to Dominique Love it. And I was just like, hmm, imagine that concept. Give it to guys that, you know, that were probably what leading receivers of before for that team, the prospective team before they before they came to Georgia. So I'm just like, yeah, get the ball in your playmakers' hands. Make it simple because, you know, I think the one of the that's one of the main reasons why I feel like this offense is getting off to 
a slow start in these games because like they're making it too complicated. And I, like I, I got um, a T how you know Randy met Michael. You know I got you know he says he said he said football is easy. Coaches make it hard. Like get the ball in the in the hands of your playmakers, whether that be Dejon Edwards or Ra Ra Thomas or uh, Dominique Lovett. Get those guys to rock because this is the time where you figure out who's who are those guys are going to be guys you're going to be able to count on when you come when things get tight. Well, maybe what the SEC championship probably, <laughs> you know, or, you know what I'm saying. So you know that might be a time. The time is now for you to find out who are going to be the guys you can count on when the situation does get tight. Now I know people can sit and look at that halftime score and say, hey, well, fourteen to three, you know, whatever. That's, that's, that's a little different, you know, in South Carolina when you know you have more talent than those guys. But at some point, you're going to get tried and you're going to have to count on somebody to get a play. And I think right now is the time where you figure that out, especially when you're talking about going up against UAB and the, and the likes of Auburn as well. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things, too, where, like you all said, this may be a situation where the pass has to set up the run because of the talent that you still have, despite having some issues with Lab McConkey injury wise and with Brock Bowers injury wise, you still have a lot, a lot of talent that you brought in expressly to make this offense continue to work under Mike Bobo, similarly to how it worked under Todd Munkin. Now, second half, yes. Offense was working on, I don't want to say all cylinders, but we'll say mo more cylinders because you're able to score got in the red zone, scored three touchdowns. Great. But that first half, it had to kind of make you think like a little bit or have a little bit of a concern about the red zone. So when you, again, kind of projecting because we don't imagine they'll have issues in the first half of the game against UAB. But I guess the question I would have for you guys is this. With what you saw in that first half, especially related to the dogs getting in the red zone and punching it in, do you feel like they still have some issues that they can address or need to address, especially maybe having the good fortune of being able to kind of reset with UAB? The biggest thing for me would be putting the defense in conflict more so. And I think you got, you got, you've, got way, you've got ways you can do that. And using Brock Bowers as the ultimate chess piece, I think, is the primary one. But there's certain things that you can do to me offensively that they're not necessarily doing at the moment to mm -hmm. put single defenders in conflict. Like even adding a little bit of element of the QB run game just as a possibility. Yeah. And he doesn't have to get 10. Go get five if it's there. So certain things with that, the way they can use Bowers, I think those are some of the things. Outside of that, it's been, it's been one little spot. In each point in time, you know, hey, a first down, one play, one bad block, one drop, something. It's been one thing, not necessarily everybody sort of stinking it up in one way uh, initially, but it's one little thing here and there. To me, so the way to fix that, put defenses in more conflict with the way you run your offense. And, and to, to add to that, too, I, I thought it was very interesting when Kirby Smart was just like, well, you know, we're running the same plays, guys. I was like, but there's a different person calling them. And yeah, I'm, you, I'm sure you know this. Like, T, when, when you think about just from a, a continuity standpoint, flow and rhythm and getting into it, like, that means something. And, and Todd Munkin was in a flow and a rhythm when it came to calling plays. And I think that – I don't think Mike Bobo has found that yet. So, so I think that – he got out to a, a nice start, you know, in the second half of the game. Like, okay, getting the ball in the playmaker's hands. And, you know, and, and hopefully Brock Bowers can get to the point where we he looks like that guy from last year because he hasn't yeah. looked like him. You know, I know he's been dealing with the injuries and everything, but I, I think that once you get your, you know, that that group of playmakers that you understand, and hopefully it, it turns out to be Ra Ra Thomas, Dominic Lovett, Brock Bowers and Dejon Edwards, you get that circle of, of friends, so to speak. You can know, hey, all I got to do is sprinkle these guys in once the game starts. And then once I get into a rhythm and the flow and we really, the talent starts to bleed out and, and show that, hey, we're better than this team and we get up on those guys by two or three scores, then that's when you kind of say, okay, you kind of figure out some things. Okay, okay, Carson Beck, are we going to start using these shot plays? Do we want to put this on tape to give – like you said, give the defense that conflict, right? Give them something to think, to think about for the next game because you, you're going to the SEC play next week. What do you want to put on film to give Auburn to say, hey, guys, we got to make sure that we watch out for this? Yeah. And, Brett, one of the things that kind of was encompassed in what you were talking about is 
getting a slow start. So how does Mike Bobo kind of address that? Again, you've got one more shot before you truly go into conference play to be able to say, hey, instead of us being on our heels coming out the second half and really kind of trying having to power through, how about we get out to a fast start and then leave it the onus on the offense of the opposing team to be able to do that, to, to have to come back. So what is it that you want to see maybe in those first couple of drives from the dogs this weekend? Early down play action. So first and second down mm -hmm. play action allows the sort of 10 to 25 yard area of the field to be really attacked. That to me has been sort of much later part of game plans. I think it needs to now be much earlier part of game mm -hmm. plans. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree uh, because, like you said, you know, everybody knows that Georgia, like you said, running back you. And that's what, you know, Georgia has been referred to for the past, what, a couple of decades now, seemingly. It, it is, you have to, and also here's, here's what I want Mike Bowler to do as well. I want him to, if Carson Beck is your guy, trust him. Trust him. Take some shots. Take shots downfield. Like, I'm talking about calculated, not just throw the ball down the field. Like, be, be, meticulous about how when you're going to take those shots and I think at the beginning of games like like Brent mentioned with that play action that's the time that you do that and, and I think that it just seems like the way Mike Bobo is calling plays it, it seems like he really doesn't trust uh Carson Beck to a certain he only trusts him to a certain extent and I think and to be quite honest I think Kirby Smart has something to do that, do with that as well so I, I believe that you know at some point you know Beck is going to get tested because it hasn't been really – I mean, I haven't been impressed. I don't know about you, Brent. I haven't been really impressed by what I've seen from Carson. But I think that, you know, he does have the arm strength to, to push the ball down the field. He does, you know, seemingly knows what, where to go with the football when things start to open up for him. So I, I, I think that Mike Bow, if you're going to have the guy in there, is he, if he's going to be your starter, I think I, I, think I just need him for the, them to trust him from a play calling standpoint and let that kind of exemplify that. I've been impressed with him. I mean, I think he's actually okay. yeah. played really well for what he's been asked to do. But also the interesting part about their offense and how it's evolved, when you think specifically with Todd Munkin coming in, it's a pro-style offense. Mm -hmm. And what do pro-style offenses above all else, what do they like? They're quarterback driven. So when I say that, I mean, hey, if you as a fan, you might see two guys running wide open down over on this side but something that the quarterback is seeing is sort of giving him choice. It's not like mm -hmm. Tennessee's offense where this guy knows I'm looking to these two guys and it's one Point of these two guys and, and, <laughs> and the ball is going out. Like that's yeah. not their offense. So yep. when you see the ball coming out really quick with him, when you see certain things they're doing, oftentimes it's as much, I think his doing mm -hmm. as it is sort of OC play calling type deal. So it's blending that and learning each other and finding that comfort zone where you can attack all levels of the field. Yeah. And I was thinking about that as well. Like just, I think to keep the defense honest, right. He's not exactly a quarterback that you'll necessarily call run plays for, right. He probably wouldn't be on the run part of the RPO, but if you can just do some things to keep that defense honest, to let them know, Hey, we, he may not be the most mobile quarterback, but there's some mobility there. Um, I think that would be helpful as well, just in terms of how to be able to, again, throw the defense off, but also opportunities, as you mentioned, Brent, to maybe get four yards here, five yards there on that first or second down so that you don't find yourself in third and long and you can find yourself more often than not being ahead of the chains. Now, our weekly dog party, well, isn't where the party stops. Locked On has you covered every single Saturday with our Bulldogs postcast, so be sure to check that out on our Locked On Sports Atlanta channel right there on YouTube. All right, now, guys, next up is UAB, Georgia hosts. The dogs are five touchdown favorites. Goodness gracious. But, hey, you think they'll cover the spread? And if so, what is it that they need to do to be able to cover that spread? What do you think, Brent? Uh, I mean, the interesting part is when you think Kirby Smart's historically, when he's favored by tons and tons of points, like you're talking about and you're getting the heavy points, upper 30s into the 40s. Yeah them against the spread is not necessarily the best of records. I think at one point it, I saw it was like one in 10 or something like that in terms of Oof. when he's a 40 plus point favorite or something like that. So, but the counter to that is 
UAB has allowed 40 plus points to Georgia Southern and Louisiana. So like eh, yeah. this this feels like one of the it feels like a week one game where it's 48 to 10 kind of thing and you're mm-hmm. very close, like yeah. if not right on uh the spread. Uh, mm-hmm. So I don't know. We'll see. I, I'm very terrible at picking against that. I say they will. Co- I'll, I'll go with the cover this week. You go cover the spread. How about you, Jarvis? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I mean, I'm not a gambling man, but if I do gamble, I do like to take calculated risk. And I think a calculated risk would be to say, hey, UAB is probably going to cover that bad boy because of the reason we just laid out for the past 25 minutes is that, hey, this offense has consistently gotten off to a slow start. And I really feel like in these type of games, if Kirby or whoever's calling plays doesn't really trust the quarterback enough to, hey, let's get let's get this uh, our passing game going. Let's work on that, our passing game for this particular game. They're going to run the football. That's going to be the default. Like, the default is, hey, get the ball to whoever's back there. And in this particular case, it's going to be De- Dejan Edwards, you know, uh, mostly. And, and I think that, you know, Given that being the case, that's what you run the clock. You're keeping, the, keeping that, that clock moving consistently. And then the defense is, you know, more than likely, they, like you said, they still have their issues as well. So it's not like they're going to get so many possessions because the defense is forcing three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out. So I, I think right now, yeah, like I said, you know, I know I'm not a gambling man, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I might put a little change on uh, UAB to cover that bad one. Blazers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> go Blazers. The, the, the fighting Trent Dilfers I have their work cut out for them this coming Saturday. So when you look across the space, whether it's offense or defense for Georgia, who's that one next guy who needs to step up in this game? Dylan Fairchild for me. Ooh, and because with Mims going out, my guess is that you see Xavier Trust, who as Jarvis mm-hmm. mentioned earlier with him playing, he looked sort of better at right tackle. Like he right. and he actually from a PFF grading standpoint. Rated out infinitely better at right tackle in the snaps he had versus left guard. Mm-hmm. So, I, thus, now you have a new starting left guard. Fairchild has played and has kind of gotten into the, a true rotation to where he's earned that, obviously. He hasn't allowed a pressure in terms of pass blocking yet. Uh, so, I think he's the, the sort of next one to step up and see, hey, can you do it consistent series after series after series when, you're, when you are consistently in the game? I'm going to go on the defensive side of football. I'm going to go with Javon Bullard. Hopefully, he's out there because – you know, it was a good sign that he actually did dress out last week. So that's a good sign. So, but he didn't play. But if he, he can come back and kind of like solidify that, that secondary, you know, because you got like Tyke Smith, like who we've been waiting to, to ever since he came. Was it? He uh, went, went to West Virginia. That's so, right. you know what I mean? So, like, we've been waiting to see him play for it seemingly like forever. So, for him to be out there and you bring Javon Bullard back, we know he's a playmaker. He's a ball hawk. He can take the ball out of the air and, and, and turn teams over. So, I'm, I'm looking for him to kind of, you know, hopefully he'll be back out on the field. But if he is, I'm sure that you won't be seeing those missed tackles and guys running wide open in, in the secondary. So, yeah, I, I'm going with Javon Bullard. Ah, okay, okay. And who's our next factor? And let me preface by saying this. Our next factor, which is the dog party version of X Factor, isn't necessarily that guy who's going to be the one who ensures that Georgia walks away with the win. No, that's not the X Factor this week. Maybe in a couple of weeks it will be. But the next factor, the X Factor for this weekend is really that one guy where you guys say, whether it's on offense, that he's the guy that has to be the X factor in order for this offense to get going early or on defense. He's the guy that's, Hey, I'm going to lead the charge of this defense imposing its will from kickoff all the way through who would be your next or X factor. You first Jarvis. Let's go. Oh man. I got to go with Dejan Edwards, man. I got to go with Dejan because I feel like that's the Georgia's default. That's who Georgia is. That's their identity. Like, and I don't know, you know, if you have, have been able to do this Brent, like, I don't, who, who are the 2023 dogs? Like, who are they? Like, and I think that, you know, it's going to have to start with that run game. So I think Dejan Edwards coming back, having a solid game last week, and I think that he's going to continue that, and he'll be my next guy to say, you know what, you know, when in doubt, if Carson Beck looking a little shaky and Dominic Love is not doing what he's supposed to be doing, Ra Ra Thomas not being Ra Ra on the field, like, hey, this is the guy that I'm going to fall back on and, and, and give and hand up, turn around and hand the football off to. Amazing when you think about it that one hasn't played this season, and then two, when he first plays in a game, he's the first Georgia back with at least 20 carries in the game since 2020. Samir White had 26, I think, against Kentucky. So, 
you know, he had an amazing performance from him last week. For me this <laughs> week, I, or I would go Ra Ra Thomas yeah. because, like, when you think about him, he's five, five receptions for 132 yards. He's almost leading the team in receiving yards. But the only missed sort of target that he's had is the one deep ball that was really great thrown deep ball, but the defender just made a made a great play at the end to knock it away against South Carolina. I think he's going to keep earning more and more time because he's actually shown himself to be better as a blocker. And if you're going if you're going to play receiver at Georgia, you have to be able to block. Yeah. And he's getting better week in and week out at that. Thus, he sees more time. Thus, he sees more targets. I think he gets a deep ball or two in this game. Yeah, he's probably the guy I'm most intrigued by as well, if for no other reason, his name. Jokes. <laughs> yeah. guys, I cannot jokes. root for a guy by the name of right. Ra Ra Thomas. Like, yeah, like, right, Ra-Ra. right. But no, but I, I, I am honestly interested in seeing what he and Lovett are going to be able to do because for me, like you said, Jarvis, it is the run game ultimately that kind of has been the brand or the identity. But under Todd Munkin, you kind of got the opportunity to see them re the dogs rebrand themselves as a group that has a, a pass catcher room that can really get it done too. So I'm kind of now we're in week four. You know, now they've had a chance to kind of get their rhythm and kind of get their chemistry going with Carson Beck. I'm really interested to see. And they should, against the Blazers, be able to really kind of play catch almost like you're in your backyard. So it'll be interesting to see this Saturday. And, of course, don't forget, guys, Locked On has you covered every Saturday with our Bulldogs postcast. So be sure to check that out on our Locked On Sports Atlanta channel that's right there on YouTube. And, guys, appreciate your time, Brent. Appreciate your time, Jarvis. And, of course, come back every week to check out the Dogs Party. See you next time.